So uh, here we are, all yours. So uh, we have a we have here a list of questions uh, we wanted to bring up. But uh, first, I, I, uh, do you have questions? Ja siis saa kysyä suomeksi myös, mutta, mutta meillä on Robert Contentfulita mukana, niin mä käännän sitten englanniksi. Mutta kysykää, jos teillä on Antille jotain, mitä haluatte nyt heti kysyä. By churn you mean the thing where... Yeah, so so that that people do orders and then they leave after a while. Of of course that's a also a problem. Uh, uh, but I think that that the basic uh, way that magazine industry and media industry have survived since now has been that uh, we called people, <laughs> all of us. You know that we know that we called people, and uh, churn in that uh, sense is way higher than when you order online. So basically everything, every magazine we sell online, they have a smaller churn rate than in, uh, sold by phone. One question. First, also about the presentation. Thank you. It sounds really impressive. Uh, one of these stuff that you mentioned should work small, most likely very well in mobile web, but what about apps? Is any of this uh, stuff working with apps? No, we don't have apps. We don't have have them a, at all. I think uh, I think Alet has made some apps in 2010, but I think that they are still recovering from it. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like basi basically, yeah. if you want to make apps, uh, your business should be. I think it should be like uh, that. You get customer money and. Yeah, transactions and for some kind of some kind of subscriptions, but at the moment we don't have them. Yeah. Hey, great questions. Other questions before we move on. I, I actually want to just come back to Antero's question about the churn. So Antti was saying that there is less churn when people have made the decision to subscribe online. And I, I want to make a, draw, a conclusion if you think of the commitment and consistency I was talking about. If I have made a commitment or a decision that, hey, I will now subscribe to I don't know, four issues of, of Image magazine. That's a decision and I have sort of committed to the brand. And even though I might not continue immediately, maybe next time when I look at my Google results, I actually then pick the one that's from Aalehde. So I think that's great because it's driving your own actions. Hey, um, I actually wanted to bring up one topic. Um, maybe some of you have followed in LinkedIn, there has been some discussions in Finland about headless architecture. I mean, we have Contentful here, which is, of course, as Steppa was saying, really the, one of the leaders on this modern content infrastructure. And there has been some discussion in LinkedIn that is it always a good choice or, or the, the author was sort of pointing out that companies have chosen a headless architecture and React front, even though when it might not be necessary, it might not be a good option for them. And uh, one of the points that was brought up there was actually SEO, that okay, this might cause you some troubles with SEO. So everybody gets to answer, but now we're gonna allow Robert to speak because you've been bravely listening <laughs> to all the presentations in Finnish. <laughs> My Finnish is much better now, thank you. <laughs> So, so when to go with the headless? What so, are the pros and cons? Uh, is this is thing on? Can you hear me? Yeah. No. Okay, good. Uh, so I think it's important to to start off by dispelling the illusion that headless is some kind of silver bullet that will solve all your problems, because of course it's not. It's a it's a different. It's it's a new solution to an old problem. Let's say. Uh, and what we mean by headless is basically decoupling your. Uh, content management from the presentation application. Normally, when you, you build a, a traditional, with a traditional CMS, you build an application that also contains the, the CMS as the, a part of the same solution, which means that the CMS might impose on you the technology stack, etc. And with the, the headless approach, you basically take the CMS out of the, the presenting application and put that somewhere else, in the cloud, for example, in Contentful's case. Uh, and what this means is it gives you the freedom to choose whatever technology you want. Uh, 
it could be React, but it's also very possible to build with a headless CMS and use uh, a completely server side based uh, technology such as .NET or, or Ruby or Python or something else that you want to build with. Uh, so the, the problems that we're talking about here, for example, with SEO uh, are not really connected with the headless choice, but rather with what kind of technology you choose to build your front end in, in this case. So with a React front end, yeah, you might have some challenges with, with SEO as you need to probably server side render some content to make sure that uh, all the uh, SEO bots can pick up your content. But with, that's disconnected from the headless approach, really. So with the headless approach, you could build an application with uh, Ruby, for example, on your server side, and, and it would render like any other uh, content management system, such as EpiServer or uh, WordPress or something else. So the difference there would not be uh, uh, on the SEO side, for example. So the question then becomes, when is it a good idea to decouple your content from your, uh, or your ap ap presenting application from your content management system? And for me, even though it's ironic that I stand here with the contentful tag, the, the answer is basically always. Because that's a, a, a guiding principle in all of software uh, architecture that you want as as little coupling as possible. And decoupling your, your uh, content management system from the application that are presenting the content is one step in the right direction, for example. Do you wanna Excellent. Yeah, Antti, you want to comment on that? Yeah, I, I think that um, the one reason to pick up a headless uh, solution is that I, I think it's good to pick up a headless solution if you are not sure what the future brings. If you know everything what will be in the future, don't pick headless and do, do it uh, with, with the things you know. But at least for us, uh, now when we have a headless solution, uh, we have possibilities. Our, our tech makes it possible to do solutions that we wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be able to do it without. And, and also with the headless solution, it's possible that now we, han, we can change our front end if we are not happy. With our React solution, we can change it. Of course, we can change the back end also. No, we are not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it would be possible that you are not like chained in any, any uh, tech solutions that w in that way. No, a, a very important point that it gives you the freedom to, since you're decoupled from the, the content management system, you can change the entire application on the front end without touching your content, basically. Hey, thanks. I know Tuya was also, you were participating in the discussion in LinkedIn. Yeah. You had some ideas on that. Yeah, so I would, okay. So, yeah, so I would say that it also depends on the, on the needs. So I was uh, mentioning in my presentation that it really depends on what kind of channel, uh, kind of a selection you have. If you have websites um, and, and they are fairly simple websites, they're not sharing too much content with each other, um, then maybe some a uh, little bit more straightforward solution might be good and then if you have more different type of uh, channels or you are actually producing this kind of multi-channel content or omni-channel content that they, you are sharing same content across different websites uh, for different brands for example then headless is of course good thing and i think that what is also important is that that the, the organization who starts implementing Headless, that they have enough knowledge on, on software development even, and how to run it. And uh, because um, in Headless, you actually, you do end up building quite a lot of yourself. And if you don't have uh, experience on that, then you might run into the situation, which I think were kind of mentioned in, in those discussions, that you sort of run out of money, and, and then you sort of end up having a house without a roof or something. So, um, yeah, so experienced and con like competent people to, to, to do the implementation and running the implementation. And, uh, and, um, and yeah, listen to the business that I think that I was, uh, I was involved in a project where the, 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 the IT was really running, in, like really pushing Contentful and, and it was the chosen solution, but they were really reluctant to, to start solving the, the problem of uh, 
of, of kind of maintaining pages because the nature of that website was still something that, okay, you need to publish certain content on the home page and so on and, and headless doesn't kind of, they don't natively support that. So you need to somehow build a solution for that and it's it's doable. I mean, we, we solved it in a, in a quite nice manner in that way, but the IT was really like that that is not needed, that, you know, it's the developers who maintain the home page. And I was like, what? <laughs> that, that doesn't, that, that I think that you need to have a good conversation between different people, the people who will be the end users, the admin users of the system and the IT. And, um, and yeah, of course, us very competent consultants. But anyway, <laughs> but I think, you know, you need to really mm -hmm. go it through. Uh, carefully with a group of people in order to find out that what is the right solution. Yes, thank you. And we didn't, I actually, I, did, I hadn't seen on this slide about their SEO rating, but if somebody is saying that with this headless site you cannot get a good SEO rating, I think we're done with that, that yeah, question now. I, I, I think that, well, we, we have had really, we are really lucky with our uh, analysts and uh, developers because they are really like top end SEO technical SEO guys, so we are really happy with them. We have had our problems, but we have solved them. Solved them. Yeah. yeah, and what comes to the SEO, it's also about how you arrange your content. Like you mentioned, you have the themes and then you have the categories. So in order to sort of have a solution that you can create these kind of clusters of content under certain topics, so that's also part of the SEO work and that needs to be sorted out on the, on the kind of on the back end solution. Because if you can't do that, then you are missing a major kind of component in the SEO altogether. Yeah, actually, Antti was giving a great segue to the next question, which is about the skills. So you've mentioned about your SEO people and you mentioned in the beginning about the developers. So it's hard to get developers. What overall um, you guys think are like the most on demand skills? Are you having trouble getting skilled people? What's the situation with the, with the people side? Who wants to go first? <laughs> Maybe I think because you kind of started about it already. Uh, uh, well, uh, well, I think uh, the, I think like basically, uh, our platta, our system, uh, the, the, we have done enough uh, of uh, digital innovations already. Uh, what we now need are, are like business innovations. Innovations like media has to uh, make make itself again and make it so new on digital side if it's not subscriptions it can be but there can there has to be also something else because not everything not every content is to be subscribed and uh and i think so i think that like the the people who understand content technology and business is that is it too much to ask <laughs> <laughs> it's a big big ask <laughs> What do no, you say, Robert? I agree. I think uh, technical product managers are, are very hard to find. And I think that that also connects back to, to what Toya was talking about, where maybe a decision uh, for the CMS was based on uh, the developers, um, where maybe every, uh, everything looks like a nail when you have a hammer. So they, they just want to implement something in React, and they think that Contentful is a great fit for that. And that might not be the right way to, to go ahead and do that. And I think in, in circumstances like that, it would be very good to have a project manager or someone on the business side with some uh, technical experience that can tell you what the implications of such a choice would be. Uh, because like I was pointing out, it's not necessarily so that you, just because you choose a headless CMS, you need to build something in React or with a front-end framework. You could just as well use a more traditional server-side approach where it's more page-based, for example. Yeah, and I would say that kind of business-minded or business-oriented architectures, architects are something that is really needed because, I mean, you can really tell that when you meet architects that some of them don't really, uh, they, they are like these kind of racehorses with the, with the blinders. And, and then when you meet the architect who actually can sort of sympathize the business people, so that's, uh, you know, that is really like a good skill set. And, and of course, if the and, and when the architect actually also should be able to code and develop him him or herself, so then that is definitely something. That is a combination that I mean I'm totally in love with. I don't know where we can find those people. <laughs> hey, thanks. Does, does anyone in the audience do you have your own experience or good ideas about in terms of um, 
the, finding the right skills for the organization. Now, Deepsa. <laughs> Uh, and I would add, add one to the thing here, which is quite aligned uh, as I was talking about the, like human behavior. So I think it's important that you understand like how human works and at the same time you understand what technology is enabling and then are able to mix and match those two. Hey, from people's side, then we've all talked a little bit about the KPIs and the objectives. Um, do you have any any sort of tangible ideas on on the types of KPIs that are really important, or or that vice versa, something that is neglected or something that's surprising in terms of what are the objectives and KPIs to look into? We haven't decided who gets to start, so whoever is is I first. <laughs> um, so I'm. I, I'm kind of familiar with the KPIs more on the kind of media and the content marketing side, but uh, and I've sort of divided them into four groups that you have uh, the reach, you have the engagement and then have the conversion and then you have the kind of the business objectives. And um, I often see that, I mean, some of the things can be could, can be kind of difficult to, to make it so tangible that you can have num numbers on them, but I would still suggest that you would if you start from the scratch, that you would really try to pick at least one KPI from each of those four categories so that, so that then you can build on. Because if you kind of are go for the easy one, like the engagement, which is like, you know, likes and views and clicks and so on, so they are sort of easy to measure, but they don't necessarily tell you enough. So having, having one KPI from each of those groups would be, I think, my suggestion that it could be difficult, but I would. I would kind of say that challenge yourself and and uh, also like setting up the analytics obviously to to kind of bring you those numbers so it's sort of it needed this whole KPI framework is needed in order for you to put your analytics in order yeah and, and uh, from my perspective when I, I start talking to a customer one thing that I always investigate and look into is uh, what we call time to production how long does it take for you to have code on your developer's machine and how fast can you get it into production. And the faster you can make this process, the more comfortable you are in making changes uh, and the, the easier it becomes to adapting to new challenges that arise. So I think that's one of the things that I usually point out that this is something that you really should try to optimize as much as, as you possibly can. And that's actually, great. if I may add, the same applies to content that, you know, yeah, how to get content out fast, yeah. I think it's kind mm. of same. Mm. Yeah, I, I think for us it's like, well, our development team, we have like a uh, team of seven plus uh, from two to ten uh, outsourced developers, depending on the situation. Uh, our KPIs are quite like easy to catch. Uh, for example, like UX designer, that he picks like something from pages per se session and something like that. But I think that uh, in addition to the 10 of us, there's also 200 more people who work with the digital content on our sites. So I think everyone should have some, uh, some KPIs that affect on, on their work. Uh, and I think, for example, journalists should start to think, and every content creator should start to think it more like the long tail of the content. For example, if you make a make a headline and make a story now about some cat who dropped out of the tree, tree uh, it can ha have like 100,000 viewers uh, today, but tomorrow and next year it will get nothing. And then you can quite easily see how much money you got it in from that uh, content. But then uh, if you make a uh, content about something that people do Google and, and they Google it this week, next week, after two years, after four years, if it gets like 10,000 views per month for you, that is quite, uh, quite rapidly uh, more valuable to your uh, company, that kind of content. And this kind of KPIs should be done with the journalists and with the analytics team you have. Hey, great. That was a great perspective also the long term. Hey, um, we are almost out of time, so we kind of all want to say a little last call to actions. My, my last call to actions would be, you know, get started. 
now it's easy to experiment, do something, test how it works and see how that influences your KPIs because everything, the experience is everything and, and you need to differentiate from the others. So get going, try what works, personalize the front page, um, get started. That would be my, my advice on, on some takeaway to go home with. But what would you guys say? Go home, optimize your time to production and good things will happen. <laughs> Thank you, that's great. What do you do, you say? Um, I would say that um, learn what, what structured content means and, and kind of get yourself familiarized with the, with the metadata. So what I, I'm sort of saying always that the metadata is kind of a semantics that the computer understands. That Antti was, I think, very well saying that, you know, the Google or, you know, they don't understand Finnish, but they understand, there's easier for them to understand these structures. So, so it's really an important kind of baseline for good, good custom experience. Excellent. Uh, I, I think that you should, like, you should all pick uh, one, uh, the most old, the oldest and the thing that everyone knows in your industry, the, the most known fact in your industry and test it, if it's true or not. <laughs> hey, that's great. Hey, thank you all. Thanks everyone. Thanks for taking the time and spending morning with us. <laughs>